arguably one of the most important molecules in all of biology, is ATP. ATP, which stands for adenosine, adenosine, tri, tri, phosphate. Triphosphate, which sounds very fancy, but all you need to remember, or anytime you see kind of ATP hanging around in some type of uh, a biochemical reaction, you should just, something in your brain should say, hey, we're dealing with biological energy. Or another way to think of ATP is the currency. It's the currency, I'll put that in quotes, of biological energy. Biological energy. So how is it a currency of energy? Well, ATP stores energy in its bonds, and I'll explain what that means in a second. And before we learn what an adenosine group or three phosphate groups looks like, you can just take a bit of a leap of faith that you can imagine ATP as being made up of something called, let me do it in a nice color, an adenosine group right there. And then it's attached to it, you might have, you'll have three phosphates, not might, you will. You'll have three phosphates attached to it, just like that. And this is ATP, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, tri, meaning three phosphate groups. Now, if you take adenosine triphosphate and you hydrolyze this bond, which means if you take this in the presence of water, so let me just throw some water in here. So let's say I have some H2O. Then one of these phosphate groups will break off. Essentially, part of this water joins to this phosphate group, and then part of it joins to this phosphate group right there. And I'll show you that in a little bit more detail, but I want to give you the big picture first. What you're left with is an adenosine group that now has two phosphates on it. So now it has two phosphates on it, and this is called adenosine diphosphate, or ADP. Before we had triphosphate, which means three phosphates. Now we have diphosphate, adenosine. So instead of a tri here, we just write a di, which means you have two phosphate groups. And it's been, so the, the ATP has been hydrolyzed, or you've broken off one of these phosphate groups. And so now you're left with ADP, and then an extra phosphate group right here. And, and this is the whole key to everything that we talk about when we're dealing with ATP. And you have some energy. And you have some energy. And so when I talk about ATP being the current of, currency of biological energy, this is why. Is that if, you, if you have ATP, and if you were to, uh, through some chemical reaction, you pop off this phosphate right here, it's going to generate energy. That energy can be used for just general heat, or you could couple this reaction with other reactions that require energy, and then those reactions will be able to move forward. So, you know, I've been, you know, I draw these circles, adenosine and phosphate, and really this is all you need to know. What I've, you know, just already what I've shown you right here is really all you need to know to kind of operationally think of how ATP operates in most biological systems. And if you want to go the other way, if you have energy and you want to generate ATP, the reaction will just go this way. Energy plus a phosphate group plus some ADP. You can go back to ATP, and so this is stored energy. So this side of the equation is stored energy, and this side of the equation is used energy. And this is really all you, well, this is, this is, this will, this is 95% of what you need to know to really understand the function of ATP in biological systems. It's just a store of energy. When you, ATP has energy, when you break a phosphate off, it generates energy. And then if you want to go from ADP and a phosphate back to ATP, you have to use energy up again. So if you have ATP, that's a source of energy. If you have ADP and you want ATP, you need to use energy. And so far, I've, you know, I've just drawn a circle with an A around it and said that's an adenosine. But sometimes I think it's satisfying to see what the molecule actually looks like. So I cut and pasted this from Wikipedia. And the reason why I didn't show this to you initially is because this looks very complicated. While the conceptual reason why ATP is the currency of energy, I think it's fairly straightforward. When it has three phosphates, one phosphate can break off, and then that'll result with some energy being uh, put into the system. Or if you want to attach that phosphate, you have to use up energy. That's just the basic principle of ATP. But this is its actual, this is its actual structure. But even here, we can break it down and see that it's really not too bad. We said adenosine. Let me draw the adenosine group. We have adenosine. This right here is adenosine. This part of the molecule right there, that is adenosine. Adenosine. And for those of you that have you know, really paid attention to some of the other videos, you might recognize that this part of adenosine, so this is called adenosine, but this part right here is adenine. That right there is adenine, which is the same adenine that, that makes up the nucleotides that's the backbone of DNA. So some of these molecules in, our, in biological systems have more than one use. This is the same adenine where we talk about adenine and guanine, and, and this is a purine, and you know, there's also the pyrimidines, but I won't go into that much. But that's the same molecule. So that's just an interesting thing. The same thing that makes up DNA is also part of what makes up the, these energy currency molecules. So that's part of the, the adenine makes part of the adenosine part of ATP. And then the other part right here is ribose. Ribose ribose, which you might also recognize from RNA, RNA, ribonucleic acid. That's because you have ribose deal in, in, in the whole uh, situation, but I won't go into that much. But ribose is just a five carbon sugar. The, when they don't draw the molecule, it's implied that it's a carbon. So this is one carbon right there, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, five carbons. And that's just nice to know. It's nice to know that they kind of share parts of their molecules with, with DNA. And that these are kind of familiar building blocks that we see over and over again. But I want to emphasize that knowing this or memorizing this in no way will help you understand kind of a simpler understanding of ATP just being what drives biological reactions. And then here I drew the three phosphate groups. And that's, that, this is their actual molecular structure, their Lewis structures right here. That's one phosphate group. This is a second phosphate group. And this is a third phosphate group, just like that. And then you're, you know, when I first learned this, my, my first question was, okay, I can, I can take this as a leap of faith that, you know, if you take one of these phosphate groups off, or if this bond is hydrolyzed, that somehow that releases energy. And then I kind of went on and answered all the questions that I had to answer. But why does it release energy? What is it about this bond that releases energy? Remember, all bonds are our electrons being shared with the different atoms. So the best way you can think about it is right here, th this, these electrons that are being shared right across this bond, or this electron that's being shared right across this bond, and it's coming from the phosphate. I won't draw the periodic table right now, but you know that phosphate has five electrons to share. It's less electronegative than oxygen, so oxygen will kind of hog the electron. But this electron is very uncomfortable. There's a couple of reasons why it is uncomfortable. It's, it's in a high energy state. One reason is why you have all these negative oxygens here, so they kind of want to push away from each other. So these, this oxygen, th these, these electrons in this bond really can't kind of get close to the nucleus or so go into kind of a low energy state. All of this is, kind of, is, is more of an analogy than the reality. We all know that electrons can get quite complex in you know, the whole quantum mechanical world. But that's a good way to think of it, that these molecules want to be away from each other, but you have these bonds, so this electron is kind of in a high energy state. It's further from the nucleuses of these two atoms than it might want to be. And when you pop this phosphate group off, all of a sudden these electrons can enter into a lower energy state, and that generates energy. So you know, this energy right here is always, in fact, in any chemical reaction, where they say energy is generated. It's always from electrons going to a lower energy state. Electrons going to lower 
energy state. That's what it's all about. And later in future videos, when we do cellular respiration and glycolysis and all of that. Glycolysis, whenever we show energy, it's really from, it's, it's electrons going from kind of uncomfortable states to more comfortable states. And in the process, they generate energy. You know, if I'm in a plane or I'm jumping out of a plane, you know, I have a lot of potential energy right when I jump out of the plane and you can kind of view that as an uncomfortable state. And then when I'm sitting on my couch on, you know, watching football, I have a lot less potential energy. So that's a very comfortable state. And I, I could have generated a lot of energy falling to the, to my couch, but I'm, I don't know, that's, my, my analogies always break down at some point. The last thing I want to kind of go over for you is exactly how this reaction happens. You know, so far you can turn off this video and you can already deal with ATP as is used in 95% of biology, especially AP bio. But I want to let you understand how this reaction actually happens. So to do that, what I'm going to do is copy and paste parts of these. So I already told you that this guy right here is going to break off. He is going to break off of the ATP. So let me copy and paste him down here. Edit and paste. So that's the phosphate group that breaks off. And then you have the rest of it. You have the ADP that's left over. So this is the ADP. I don't even have to copy and paste all of this stuff. You can just accept that that's the adenosine group. Copy and then paste. Just like that. So we've already said that this thing gets hydrolyzed off or gets cut off, and that generates energy. And what I want to do is actually show you the mechanism, a little bit of a hand wavy mechanism of how this actually happens. So I said that this reaction occurs in the presence of water. So let me draw some water here so I can have an oxygen and a hydrogen, and then I have another hydrogen. That's water right there. So hydrolysis is just a reaction where you say, hey, you know, this guy here, he's got a, you know, he wants to bond with something or he wants to share someone else's electrons. So maybe this hydrogen right here goes down here and shares its electron with this oxygen right here. And then this phosphorus, he, well, it has it has an extra electron that it needs to share. Remember, it has five valence electrons. It wants to share them with oxygen. It has one, two, three, four being shared right now. Well, if this if this hydrogen goes to this guy, then you're left with these, this blue OH right here, and this guy can share one of this the phosphorus's extra electrons. So you get the OH just like that. So that's the actual process that happens. And it could go in the other it could go the other way as well. I could have cleaved it here. I could have cleaved the whole thing here, and so this guy would have kept the oxygen, and the hydrogen would have gone to him, and then this guy would have taken the OH. It could happen in either order, and, and, and so either order would be fine. And there's one other kind of point I want to make, and this is a little bit more complex. I'm, I was even wondering whether I want to make it. You know, my, my whole reason why you're kind of in a lower energy state is you know, once you break apart. Actually, let me go down here. It's because I said, hey, you know, this electron is happier when it's, when it's, so let's say this electron that was part of this phosphorus is happier now. It's in a lower energy state because it's not being stretched. It's not having to spend time between that guy and that guy because this molecule and this molecule want to spread apart because they have the negative charges. That's part of the reason. The other reason why, and we'll talk about this in a lot more detail when we, when we learn more about organic chemistry, is that this has more resonance, more resonance structures or resonance configurations. And all that means is that these electrons, these extra electrons here, they can kind of move about between the different atoms. And that makes it even more stable. So if you imagine that, you know, this oxygen right here has an extra, extra electron with it. So that extra electron right there, it could come down here. It could come down here and then form a double bond with the phosphorus, and then, the and then this electron right here can then jump back up to that oxygen. And then that could happen on this side and on that side, and I won't go into the details, but that's another reason why it makes it more stable. If you've already taken organic chemistry, you can kind of appreciate that more. But I don't want to get it, you know, all into the weeds. The most important thing to remember about ATP is that when you, when you cleave off a phosphate group, it generates energy that can drive all sorts of biological functions like growth and movement, muscle movement, muscle contraction, um, uh, electrical impulses in nerves and the brain. So this is the main kind of battery or currency of energy in biological systems. That's the main thing that you really just need to remember about ATP.